Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from bearmarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence based biblical advice for your parenting and your marriage and your sex life. And I am joined today by my daughter, Rebecca Lindenbach. Hola. And we are celebrating. What are we celebrating, Rebecca? We're celebrating a year of She Deserves Better. It's the birthday. Yes. yes. So we wrote. She, our book, She Deserves Better, it's based on a survey of 7,000 predominantly evangelical women. Mm-hmm. I think 7,400 or something. Well, it's, it's, Tell us why it's 7,400. So we did, we used SurveyMonkey for our surveys, right? So mm-hmm. we did GSR, the Great Sex Rescue. We got the unlimited package. We're like, you just get unlimited amount of questions, unlimited amount of respondents, unlimited everything. We did that, got like 22,000 respondents crashed survey monkey yes. like crashed them big time they mm-hmm. had to go they had to use an ftp protocol to go into their back servers to get us our data yeah they, we couldn't even download it no so anyway so then we went to do our next one there's no unlimited option anymore <laughs> it caps you at 7500 well you have to start paying more money yeah, so well, like, like you yes yeah, so you get like you pay a flat rate up to the first 7500 and then you yeah. have to pay per respondent and, after that and we were cheap <laughs> and we were cheap and we were like you know what like joanna ran all of the 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 statistical models to figure out how 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 many participants we need for for the power that we need and she's like 7500 is like triple what we need so We're the gonna... minute we got to seven seven thousand four hundred and like sixty, we <laughs> shut her down because we did not want to pay anything more so, so yeah. we broke survey monkey no, we're sorry about that if you're a researcher trying to use survey monkey yeah it's probably it. our fault because you can't do but, unlimited you know after we were great sex rescue so many people were saying this book really set me free mm-hmm. and i feel so great please everybody go to amazon Look up Great Sex Rescue and read the reviews because that's what people say. Like, I I feel so validated. I feel so free. But now I have absolutely no idea what to tell my kids. Mm -hmm. And so She Deserves Better came out of that. So we were looking at how things that girls experienced as teenagers in church, so messages they were taught, things they believed, rules they had around dating, things they might have under, undergone at youth group, how did those things impact them long term? So we looked at marital and sexual satisfaction, if they got married, if they wanted to get married. We looked at long term self esteem, like all kinds of different outcome variables. Yeah. And we focused on all kinds of different things. And at the end of each chapter, there's exercises that you can walk through with your daughter or if you're a youth leader with your, the girls in your youth group. And we've just really been blown away by the reaction. It's been really, really freeing. So many people have only read STB, she does it better, and not Great Sex Rescue. And they recommend it all the time on Instagram. And yeah, so again, just really freeing to be able to tell girls, hey, you deserved better, Mm -hmm. you know? And so let's give the next generation more. Exactly. Let's stop it now. And, And so we thought today we could have a little bit of a conversation with someone who's been doing kind of a similar thing on the men's side, Mm -hmm. Zachary Wagner, who wrote the book, Non-Toxic Masculinity, because as we've been calling out purity culture, Mm -hmm. people then respond to our critiques and say, well, here's all the reasons why you're wrong. And so we thought we could run through some That's of a very critiques. generous way to describe what they're doing. They're not responding to the critiques. <laughs> they're not engaging with the critiques okay, in any true. meaningful way. They're saying there are critics and they're bad. Yes, that's so, anyway, but you're about to see three examples. So, so look. here we go, and we'll bring on Zach now. Well, we are so happy to have one of our friends back on the podcast, Zachary Wagner, who is the author of non toxic masculinity right here and zach you've been on for one podcast where you talked about this book and you were our yes. guest along with andrew bowman when we talked about the wonderful book every young man's battle that was um, <laughs> facetious that use yes, of wonderful was quite facetious for anyone who's new here <laughs> So welcome again. We're glad to have you. Yeah, great to be here as always. And thanks for having me back. Yeah. So something funny happened to Zachary about a year ago where (laughs) his book came out and then the Gospel Coalition, Shane Morris, decided to write a review of it. And the review was kind of problematic. I don't even want to talk about that review because it's kind of irrelevant. The main thing I want to talk about is Zachary wrote a really, really good response. Yeah to that review and to the to the critics of his book. And I think Zachary's response kind of relates to our book too and what people have been saying about She Deserves Better. So oh, I absolutely. thought I thought we could just have Zachary on and we could work through some of the points because I think these are common ways that people that are still stuck in purity culture thinking react when we start bringing up, hey, this stuff was harmful. Hmm. And so I thought we could just dig into that. Sure. All right. So first of all, let's start with your definition of purity culture, which I really like. You said, here's how I define the term. Purity culture refers to the theological assumptions, discipleship materials, 
events and rhetorical strategies used to promote traditional Christian sexual ethics in response to the sexual revolution. That's a great, that's a great definition. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like I think. It's not about sexual ethics. That, that wasn't really the point. Correct. Yeah. I think there are some critics of purity culture out there who would define it as any sort of kind of quote unquote restrictive sexual ethic or any sort of particularly any type of teaching that says sex and marriage ought to go together. And that was something as I was kind of processing some of my own story and history with purity culture, you know, four or five years ago is six years ago, maybe is when that especially started for me that irritated me about some of the converse, some of the conversations I, you know, I don't want to generalize, but some of the critics would, it seemed to me, use purity culture in this kind of sloppy way. And I actually just don't think that's a helpful definition of purity culture. Any that that wouldn't be unique to Christianity. It's something, you know, a, a tr quote unquote, traditional sexual ethics are something that it's not just an American evangelical subcultural thing from uh, from. 20 years ago it's mm -hmm. it's 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 millennia old and it's it has a massive kind of tradition in all sorts of religious and church traditions as well so yeah. when we're talking about purity culture i think it's really important to historically situate it in that history that i just alluded to before the kind of history of the last 50 60 years beginning with the sexual revolution and what in particular the north american church did in response to that. I think we're on a much better foundation for understanding kind of this is overused in these conversations, but kind of like what's the baby, what's the bathwater? How can we have a helpful conversation about what is historic Christianity that we might want to hold on to? And what is the cultural trappings around that that in many cases were less helpful or even unhelpful? So I, that's what I'm trying to get at with that definition. And I'm happy, happy to hear that I met with your approval. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I have the advantage of age <laughs> Sure. Yeah. <laughs> over both of you. And, you know, I grew up in downtown Toronto. We definitely heard like in my youth group about traditional sexual ethics, you know, wait for marriage. I did not yeah. ever hear a modesty message. I did not ever hear yes. that I was responsible for boys not sinning. I, I mean, did... I've seen the pictures of what men were wearing in the seventies and eighties. Oh, there yeah. there <laughs> were <laughs> Like, messages like yes i'm saying yes. like the 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 crop tops and short short combo. the man thigh yeah yes, yeah the man thigh like they're, yeah. they're it's not like people were all covered up back then no, no. absolutely not so anyway i i think that's that's really clear and what we're and what we're trying mm. what we try to do in she deserves better was say hey you know you can raise your daughter with values and to follow Jesus without all these trappings. And that's what you sure. were calling up for boys too in non-toxic masculinity. So, so good. I okay. also think that there's a lot of understanding in the general culture that the sexual, having sexual boundaries is a, a good thing. The mm -hmm. issue is, you know, yeah. when we're trying to define people by what they've done. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. when we're telling people what their worth is or that kind of thing so like the idea that any sexual boundaries automatically purity culture i just i i have if you can find me evidence in the peer-reviewed literature that having boundaries for sex like for your sexual activity is harmful in high school i would love to see it but yeah, I, sure. I don't see it what i do see is is the harm is in things like this where yeah. The rhetoric, the events, the identity, exactly what you have in your definition there. Yeah. And, we, and this is what we talk about and she deserves better a ton. So please pick up the book for the one year anniversary and help us and give it away. Okay. So you, in your, in your critique of this review, you kind of have five big points and I want to work through them in order. And the sure. first one is people accuse you of throwing out sexual ethics. You know, that if we're going to throw out purity culture, it means that we're throwing out all sexual ethics. And yep. as we said, that's not that's not the point at all. But here's here's one. Here's something that you said. One of the questions I wanted to ask myself and my readers in writing this book was whether there was a way to address the most serious and egregious issues of sexual hypocrisy in the church today without revising a traditional sexual ethic. And to do so in a way that might be of some help to people of my generation who are literally losing their faith because of these issues. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's our thing too. Like it is pastorally irresponsible, as you mm. said, to not address this stuff because people are walking away from the faith. And so to not admit that harm was done is like, 
irresponsible. And and I want to play yeah. a clip from Bob Gresh. This was from last week. Bob and Dana Gresh spoke at Cedarville University. They did a Q&A. And Dana Gresh, we talked about her a lot, and she deserves better. She's the one who wrote Secret Keeper Girl, who talked about how eight-year-olds' bellies are intoxicating mm -hmm. to grown men, and intoxicating means that men get out of control. She wrote the terrible submission quiz. She was the one who gave false information about condoms and infertility, all kinds of scare tactics. And they did this in their books, like, And the Bride Wore White. Oh, Same yes. Thing, she co-authored Lies Young Women Believe, and we'll be talking about that book next week on the podcast. And they've been getting a lot of pushback. And so I want to play this clip. But to set it up, I just want to say how interesting I think this is, because they were supposed to give a talk. And instead, Bob ended up interviewing Dana and talking and defending themselves about how they hadn't actually hurt people. Yeah. And this was at Cedarville. Exactly. Cedarville is like wild. It's like, really conservative. Like it's more conservative than SBC seminaries. And they still felt that they had to defend themselves. So, I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. actually good news. I think that that means that there's some pushback coming. But, mm -hmm. but let's listen to what Bob says. Now, I want to say something else. Dana led purity culture. She wrote about purity culture. And I'm sort of sick and tired of hearing everybody beat up purity culture as the most traumatic thing they've ever gone through. And I'm also sick and tired. I'm, all, I'm sick and tired of that woke message. And I'm also sick and tired of Christian leaders and institutions and people that won't wake up to some of those messages and know that the good days weren't always so good. There were mistakes. There were things that hurt people. Don't let your life be wrecked by a book. It's a book. Don't spend your life criticizing, becoming cynical. Don't just ingest every day from your phone negative, critical spirit from people who half the time don't know what they're talking about, and they have no solutions. They don't deal in solutions and answers. They deal in criticism, and it never gets to the exact point. So I want to say that there are things we would change, and I'm going to ask Dan about that today. But for those of you who throw out purity and sexuality and modesty because you don't like pure, uh, purity culture, you need to start to grow up and realize that life is very complicated and that you get older and wiser and that clickbait is easy when you just say nasty things. You get clicks. All right. I love that. How, what, what, what was it about the book? You know, a book. Like, don't let a book ruin your life. Don't let it's a book a ruin book. your life. It's just a book. Yeah. You yeah, know, but it's not just a book because you said it was from God. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that, that's what I always find very funny is it's funny how inspired by God and how biblical and yeah. how Christian this all is until it starts to be proven wrong. Then, well, it's just a book. It's just silly. Like, yeah. don't worry about it. It's a book. Yeah. It's like, like, and then, and then they accuse us of being clickbaity when we, we, we literally just use their own quotes. Yeah. Like if their own quotes are so terrible, that they're clickbaity. <laughs> I think that should prompt some, yeah. some reflection. But what he's saying here at the end was, look, if you throw up purity culture, then you have no way, like we have to figure out how to talk about modesty and about, you know, sexual ethics and all of these things. And, and this is what they can't let go of is they can't let go of the idea that hyper modesty needs to be taught. You know, and I just I like like so they say they know that purity culture was harmful, but they can't let go of it. Well, I think that he 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 even gets mad at the idea that people say that it was quite traumatic, right? He says like, "Hey, I'm just sick and tired of these people saying that purity culture is the most traumatic thing they've ever been through." And it's like, "Okay, 
<laughs> you know, it probably is really hard for you, Bob, to <laughs> hear that all the 12 year old girls like me who read your creepy articles, and I will say they were creepy. Yeah. But like, as someone who now has a husband who is still 10 years younger, at least, than Bob Gresh was when he was writing those articles to me at 12. Thinking about being in the mindset of a man that old writing to preteen girls about their bodies that explicitly, there is no word for it other than creepy. And Bob might feel uncomfortable about that. But you know what you can do then? You can say, yeah, it was creepy. It was a weird time. You know, we're going to retire and take care of our grandkids now. Like, that's the answer. It's not to get mad at everyone for calling the creepy thing creepy. Mm -hmm. Like, every now and then I look at Connor and I'm like, you're still only 30. And it would still be creepy for you to write that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like, I think he was the one who wrote the, like, seeing seeing a girl in a short short skirt is like putting a spiritual, a noose around the spiritual life. Yeah. of the boys around you and I'm just like mm. these kinds of things are weird and explaining how you know your body makes a shape in a man's mind and he can't help but think of it and this is what advertisers do and this is the power your body has it's really creepy mm-hmm. something and- that was striking uh, sorry I was just gonna say something that was striking to me about that clip particularly in the bit you know I can see I can see to some extent the point of like don't spend all of your life all of your time obsessing about some book that you read 20 years ago and you know point taken i think there is a sense where we can in thinking about our stories about our you know childhood traumas you know whether with a capital t or a lowercase t trauma where you can kind of cycle on that in an unhealthy way rather than moving through the healing process and the journey of what does this mean for me now? Fair enough, point taken. But the whole like, you know, you grow up and you mature implication that was underneath his comments here. Something that came to mind for me is like, this was given to, to teenagers, like, and and authorized as like this is the godly divine biblical way of thinking about these issues that teenagers are just just starting to learn so it's like if if you learn to drive a car the wrong way you don't like there's some culpability for the adults who taught you to drive that car that way if they're teaching you to drive it wrong. I'm not sure if that analogy is especially No, it, a, it absolutely does. Because that's, that's what he said. He, he opens by saying that Dana was purity culture. Yes. You know, and, and what we found too, like we were not measuring the effects of books. I want to make that clear. In our yeah, survey, totally. she deserves better. We measured the effects of teachings. Yeah. And then we looked at where these teachings could be found. And they were found throughout Dana's books. And the simple fact is the more that people are exposed to teachings, like the modesty messages, how your body is a stumbling block and it can cause boys to sin, like the sexual gatekeeper idea where boys can't help themselves, they're going to pass a point of no return. And so you need to be the one to put the brakes on if you don't want to have sex. You know, all, all of these kinds of messages that girls heard over and over and over again, that girls talk too much, that they need to make themselves smaller. These were in Dana's books. And because Dana influenced, not not just through her own books, but through Real Magazine, mm-hmm. like she she influenced a whole generation of youth pastors who all taught this stuff. So the girls, even if they didn't read Dana's books, were still influenced by the things that Dana said. And yeah, I'm I'm sorry that they can't just admit that. And that they're what they're saying is our problem is we're not offering solutions. And I think it's very likely that they honestly believe that we're not offering solutions. And I think that's for two reasons. I think, first of all, they haven't actually read our materials. Yeah. The fact that they consistently get wrong, even the most basic thing about what our survey was or studied, I think that they're getting their information from other people. Yeah, I want to say I was in a I was in a Facebook conversation with Bob Gresh last week, and he kept saying that just because hundreds of people have complained on Facebook about our book, and it's like, it's not, Bob, we surveyed thousands upon thousands of people like it's not about and it's not complaints about your book it's complaints about this teaching that we then Mm -hmm. found exact quotes of in your book Mm -hmm. it's like 
But I think the other thing is that, so I think there's one thing, which is they haven't actually read anything that they're critiquing or yes. that they're mad about, which is She Deserves Better, by and the way. At the end of each chapter in She Deserves Better, we have exercises to do. We have mothers all- and daughters, lots of fun role-playing things. Like well, there's lots of solutions. And throughout the, entire, throughout the entire book, we compare what we are told with how things should have been, right? So there's mm-hmm. like that. But the other reason that they think that we have no solutions, I think, is because part of the, so- a lot of the solution is just to stop. Yeah. It's not like we need something to fill the vacuum of this. It's like it always could have just been about Jesus. We added unnecessary steps to the gospel and we're just Mm -hmm. getting rid of them. And so they're saying, yeah, but what about making sure the girls don't show their shoulders? Like, well, they can show their shoulders. Like, that is okay. But also there's a level where it's like, we know that we tend to dress in shocking or provocative ways for reasons. And often a lot of those reasons tend to be self-esteem related or they tend to be, you know, because we're seeking attention or because we enjoy having that, uh, that reaction from people. And when we become, frankly, if we focus more, it's becoming more spiritually healthy and spiritually holistically, Mm -hmm. you know, there's just, peaceful and and one with god all that kind of stuff a lot of these issues do genuinely kind of go to the wayside like i have been raving the the anti-modesty like messages forever and i'm still not out there in pasties and fishnet stockings like you know what i mean like it's there's a level where this is sometimes we're making a problem where there was again my age here shows this but when i was in youth group we just didn't talk about modesty and people were not walking around wearing nothing like it just they really weren't. Mm-hmm. It just, and so I think if we can just get back to Jesus and get back to focusing on faith and and who you are in Christ, a lot of this stuff won't matter. And and that's the problem is trying to add to it. Okay, you yeah. want the second point? Is yeah, that okay? By all means. I, okay. Yep. Yep. Let, let's do it. The second attack that that was made against you, and this one doesn't fit with she deserves better as much, but I think it's still important to bring up, is that it's claimed that Zachary was saying that purity culture brought in toxic masculinity right? That, that it was purity culture that caused it. And Zachary's like, no, 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 (laughs) no. And I'll read, I'll read you this. I wrote that the more urgent ethical imperative of our time isn't whether teenagers are having sex with their boyfriends or girlfriends. It is how we can stem the ongoing epidemic of abuse and dehumanization in our churches. But Morris suggests this is evidence that I am unconcerned with Christian sexual ethics, or at least that the historic Christian sexual ethic itself is not essential to my argument. However, this betrays a narrow view of sexual ethics, where said ethics are only about premarital abstinence or opposing same-sex practice. But surely Morris would grant that a robustly Christian sexual ethic must include a forceful rejection of sexual violence and dehumanization. Indeed, I would argue that as long as we fail to take seriously and address the epidemic of abuse in the church, any arguments for traditional views on sexuality will rightly continue to be seen as hollow and hypocritical. Yep. I, I actually I was I was gonna play this clip later in the podcast. But, sure. But can I play this clip now? This is from Fred Stoker, who is one of the co-authors of Every Man's Battle and Every Young Man's Battle. And this is from an episode he did on the focus on the family. Ah, broadcast. yeah. Our favorite. Okay. Mm. So let's just listen to Fred for a minute here. The second vulnerability in a man is this. Our sexuality, our native language of passing intimacy with a girl is pretty sexual, okay? So what happens is, is that when we're with a girl, the natural way we're going to want to express that is sexually, okay? Now, we know we can't do that biblically, but we tend to want to express it that way. But the biggest problem is not how much we're pushing on the boundaries of our girlfriends. The biggest problem that that creates in our lives is this, that we can look at a naked picture of a girl, it's just a picture, okay? But when we enter into self-gratification as we view that and we have this big burst of pleasure chemicals into the brain, that gives us this really medicated feeling. And even though that's not genuine intimacy because it's just a girl on a page, it has this sense of intimacy in us because of the way our sexuality is built. And so what happens over time is that, let's say our dad gets divorced or you know, we lose our spot on the football team or we break up with a girl, whatever. Any of those kinds of emotional blows that we take, we can easily run to pornography or some other sexuality. So it's it's used as a form of medication? It's like a drug to us. It's a medicating drug for us. And so think about it. 
We've got eyes that can draw sexual gratification from anything around us. And then think about how girls dress across this nation. All right. Here's why I wanted to play that clip. He said the biggest problem is not how much we are pushing the sexual boundaries of our girlfriends. The biggest problem is when we turn to lust and masturbation. Do you know what the word is? There's another word for pushing the sexual boundaries of your girlfriend. (laughs) And that would be assault. (laughs) So he's saying sexual assault's not the problem. The problem is porn and masturbation. Yeah. I what was striking to me about this clip was the way and this is something I talk about in my book extensively. And this is my biggest beef with just the whole framing of every man's battle is the way it universalizes the sexual as like the essential like Mm -hmm. male coping mechanism for any bad feeling that you ever have. So he he's right to say, you know that in many men's lives this can certain types of lustful acting out masturbation indulging in pornography you know sinning sexually in various ways i suppose can be a coping mechanism that men kind of habituate around but i think it is so so unhelpful and frankly you know just i try to stay away from this stuff just because i guess it's quote unquote triggering for me these days but i just think it's so unhelpful to frame up this is what men do as just kind of like the bottom line of what it means to be a man is that when you have a when you have a hard day when you have a sad feeling you sin sexually and it is it is the case that that's the what some men and by the way some women also might struggle with in their kind of walk with the lord or their personal life or you know we all we all struggle in many ways but the way that it is narrowed around this male experience again something i say in my book is i worry it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where when you're telling young men you know as you grow up the biggest challenge that every man every man's battle that you're gonna face is every time you're sad, you're going to go lust or mm-hmm. masturbate or something like that. Or every time you're angry, this is going to be the main way you sin. And it's this, another thing I talk about in my book is the way it creates a, a sexual exceptionalism is the word that I that I say, where like the, the types of sins that we need to be most concerned about are sexual sins. And we do need to care about sexual sins. Scripture talks about sexual sin. Of course, that's the case. But kind of going back to the previous conversation, I think a focus on the example of the Lord Jesus, as well as the other virtues in commended in the New Testament, like a properly biblically understood definition of modesty that would include flaunting of wealth and attention seeking and all Mm -hmm. sorts of things like this. These are questions of virtue. But when we shrink the idea of modesty down around this responsibility that women have to cover their bodies in certain ways, that's not really virtue. That's just kind of like a certain type of regulation. But the deeper questions for men are like, what are the attitudes of entitlement I have around my sexuality and around women's bodies? And what are the ways that I have failed to cultivate the virtue of self-control or governing my ways of looking at and thinking about people in ways that are honoring and respectful to them? It's, It's like so easy and simple but ultimately harmful to just say, you know, tell women how to dress and not ask the men the harder virtue questions around the way they perceive the women around them and their bodies. Mm -hmm. And I would also say to ask women the hard questions that you were uh, alluding to, Becca, I'm like, why, like, you don't just dress immodestly for its own sake, quote unquote, in, Mm -hmm. in these arguments. Like, what is it, it, like what's the self-esteem issue it's not just like oh my gosh this is some egregious sexual issue that we just need to lock down because we need to control women in this way because men are gonna sin and the church is gonna fall apart or something like that i don't i don't know yeah. like i think there are deeper questions of virtue that are rarely asked in purity culture because it is so surfacey, it is so focused on externals and it's not the kind of deeper transformation of the heart that we see commended in the new testament
Yeah. And I think that's because like we were talking about earlier, we've cheapened the gospel by adding things to it. And when we added Mm -hmm. all these rules about when we, when we made sex, another false God, right? Because I, I, I know I wrote about this on good Friday. I think like the idea that sex is the one sin that it doesn't seem like the cross could fully cover because we have to, we have to get women to cover up in order for men not to be able to lust. Mm -hmm. It's not that men are just able to be free from lust. They're only able to be free from lust if girls do their part, right? There's no other, there's no other sin that we believe that about. Not really. That's really interesting. (laughs) And so this, it's the idea that, yeah, sex is the one sin that Jesus couldn't cover on the cross. The idea that, Mm -hmm. you know, if you give up your most precious gift, now you are worth less than you mm-hmm. were before right you can never really be new again all these totally. different things and, and what happens when we add things to the gospel is we shrink jesus in the process it's it's in our heads not in reality obviously but it's like as we're walking towards something else to worship we get farther and farther away from christ mm-hmm. and what happens when we do that is when we erect this new God, <laughs> erect is a funny word to use this context. Anyway, when we erect this new God <laughs> of sex, right? It stops being a community issue and it starts being really only seen in terms of individual purity mm. too, right? Sure. So this idea that it's most important, like if you're assaulting a real life woman, well, at least you're yes. not being, at least it's not porn. Because yeah. being no, a real actually. life woman is closer to it being okay, which is when you're just allowed to rape your wife. That's okay. So if it's a real life woman, yeah. so I'm being very facetious here, but <laughs> that is what every man's battle in essence tells people. Like if you're if you're forcing or coercing your wife, just make sure it's not too often. Yeah. Well, the, like, the, the actual quote was, "We know some men who are." coercing their wives one to even multiple times a day if you're demanding sex more than once a day you have a problem yes yeah, so you can demand yeah. sex once a day but not more, than than. <laughs> not more than once a day yeah so like this this idea though where like if you're assaulting yeah. a girl in person it's seen as holier than watching porn because at least it totally. seems more like how you're supposed to do it which is when yeah. you're married and, and that those is are only able to be seen that way when we have put up this new god yeah because and those no are way. the harder questions i was gonna say is like the question of like what are the kind of psychological spiritual even theological dynamics of the way i relate to my partner the way i relate Mm. to my spouse and not just do i have a right to this type of sexual encounter in this moment because i'm a man or something i don't know (laughs) because any teaching that would be male specific on that you could i mean assuming people have first corinthians 7 in that mind which is like Mm -hmm. radically egalitarian like the woman has every the the man's body does not belong to himself but to his wife which Mm -hmm. is a pretty crazy thing to say in the first century so yeah what's going on in my head in this conversation is like the Pressing into the into the deeper questions that are actually hard to face, because I think you're right that there is a certain type of like the cross can cover and take care of these types of sins. But sexual sins, we actually need this additional regulatory. And, and, and you know, I don't want to say, it, as we said early in the conversation, it's not like sexual regulation regulations are bad. In fact, they're essential in certain ways. But when it becomes an oppressive, overly regulated thing that is all about superficial externals and not about the deeper matters of the heart. And like, do do am I am I dehumanizing my wife in the way mm-hmm. that I think about my quote unquote right to her body sexually. And yeah, I think I yeah. think that like it comes back to just exactly why Jesus's ministry was so important too, right? Because he was really modeling in a in its own form of purity culture, like religious context as well, where it was very focused on, you know, following, you know, the mm-hmm. rules. And then he walks in, it's like, well, was the Sabbath created for man or man for the Sabbath? Mm-hmm. And it's similar here. And so in both of these situations that we're, we're seeing here in, you know, well, especially in the Fred Stoker clip, right? The idea that the girl should matter at all isn't mm-hmm. even considered because we're back in that situation of was the Sabbath made for man or man for the Sabbath, right? Mm-hmm. Was like, it, what's the point of sexual purity? And these are the questions yeah. Jesus wanted us to ask. And we've totally missed the point in purity culture because the point of purity culture, the point of all that stuff that Bob Grush taught me when I was 13 was to make sure that I didn't, you know, quote unquote, make a boy assault me. Yeah. And something and that's, else. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and so something else really interesting that I've actually 
more recently been thinking about because I'm doing some research for my scholarship on the Gospel of Matthew. So I've been thinking a lot about the Sermon on the Mount. So there's a couple couple references to kind of sexuality in the Sermon on the Mount. The one that people often think of in context of this conversation is when Jesus says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, if you look at a woman lustfully, that person has already committed adultery in their heart. So this actually is relevant to what we're talking about here, because what people are thinking about is do not commit an adultery commandment out of the Ten Commandments. And like, that's the rule. You sh- like, do not commit adultery. That is like very clearly defined. Don't sleep with someone else's spouse. And <laughs> that's like an easy one to follow. And I think Similarly, a lot of people will like kind of pat themselves on the back and be like, sweet, I didn't have an affair. I'm good on the commandment. But what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman's, he's taking us out of the fifth commandment and putting us in the in the tenth. Do not covet, which mm-hmm. is a turn at the end of the Ten Commandments to the matters of the heart. That is a much more difficult command to obey where you're no longer responsible for just what you do with your body. Of course, we are responsible for that. And ironically, a lot of times the sexual sins that men have committed in the church against women are downplayed in a really bizarre way. So it's like this, you want it both ways. You're like, uh, just matters what you do with your body. But when a man sins sexually, it actually doesn't matter all that much for some bizarre reason. (laughs) But what Jesus is doing when he draws attention to looking at a woman lustfully He's saying, don't just kind of pat yourself on the back because you haven't had an affair. Think about what the habits of your mind and your heart are towards the people around you. But then what purity culture does is it says, okay, Jesus says don't lust at women. So let's just create more rules around what women wear rather than do the work that Jesus is telling us to do. Well, and that's what I found so transforming the way we look at women. Yeah. That's what I found so strange about the clip is it like the answer to the fact that men are emotionally regulating themselves through masturbation wasn't for men to learn to emotionally regulate some other way. It was for yes. women to cover oh up. Oh my goodness. So it's easier, it is easier in their mind for every single woman in the world to change <laughs> how they dress than for this guy to go to therapy. Yeah. Yes. Like, no, that's exactly, that's the joke that came to my mind as well. Men will literally tell every woman in the world to dress a certain way instead of going to therapy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh. let's, let's, let's go through a couple more of these. Th- the third attack people make, we could just deal with this one really quickly. Look at all these secular guys who don't have purity culture, but they did terrible things. So? I find that yeah. bizarre. Like when, when you point out that, hey, this stuff harmed what are we, us. What are we talking about? Yeah, then people say, well, look at how much harm there is in the world. It's, it's like, like, well, yeah, yeah, but so what? Like, we're talking well, about the, the world got a 28%, so we got a 34%. We're doing awesome. We're like, well, <laughs> no, guys, we're not measuring ourselves against the world. We're measuring ourselves against Christ, right? Yeah. Like, that's the whole point of being a Christian, not a, not the world ends. <laughs> like, it's, it, it's, anyway. It, literally, we have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so. yeah. It, like, again, this is all just like transformation. Surely, surely the spirit of God should empower the church to do markedly better than the world. Yeah. And you know, when, when we wrote, she deserves better. We said at the beginning that we weren't writing a book about how much the world has messed up our teenage girls. And, and we acknowledge that the world has done a lot of harm because there's already a ton of books about that. That's basically all that's been written. What we're trying to say is, look, here's how the messages in the church have hurt. And I think that's legitimate to look at. So sure. The whole, well, we're doing better than them isn't really a good argument. Okay. It also depends on what you're measuring, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fourth attack. And this one I find really interesting. This is actually the one I want to talk about the most is all of this critique of purity culture is just coming out because you guys are traumatized and abused and you're trying to replace the gospel with therapy. And to introduce this, I want to play a clip from a podcast that musician Matthew West did with Ali Beth Stuckey. And the, this happened back in 2021. Matthew West released a song. I think it was only live for like a week and a half. It was not live for long. Called was Lattice this on an Lattice. album or was it just like it a, was a kind single? Of like he just released a single and he did he, he did, did a video and he did perform it at the Southern Baptist Convention like annual meeting. Did he? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure. Like you can fact check me on that, but he 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 did perform it at some big Southern yeah. Baptist event. Anyway, he did try to take completely off the internet afterwards because yeah. like like news I think major major publications picked it up and there was just so much backlash because he was saying he he was just telling girls that they needed to be modest 
And it was, it was like the modesty message on steroids. And we of course measured the effect of the modesty message on girls and she deserves better, you know, and how, when girls believe the modesty message, they are 67% more likely to marry an abuser. They are 54% more likely to have vaginismus. So sexual pain disorders, it's, it's really, really problematic. So anyway, let's listen to what Matthew West says about the response to his song. I just think this is demonic, but we actually hear this from these same critics. That's that's rape culture. That's what I saw. Right. And I imagine, I, I can't even imagine how like hurtful that is to hear as a dad of, of daughters. And it's just, it's just terrible. And so that's why I made the podcast episode that I did just to say, wait, 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 I understand some people's hurt. I understand some people's experience that maybe this song unknowingly was a trigger for some people who had a hard time with purity culture, whatever it was. I understand that sinners and abusive happened in the church in the name of purity culture. I get right. all that, but God cares about it. And here's what scripture has to say about it. We can't just go run in the other direction and pretend like God doesn't care about this because he does. Yeah. I thought um, I was really shaken up by when I started seeing terms, like when it took a step past purity culture towards rape culture, Yeah. That shook me because I was like, whoa, whoa. And uh, there were many moments where I felt like people were, sometimes it's the blessing of music and the curse of music. The, the upside and the downside is that people are, you know, listening to music and then they're applying their own narrative. They're finding their own story in a piece of music. And in this case, some people had, you know, chapters of their story that they would consider to be damaging ones by something that happened to them from a church leader or a doctrine that was taught or whatever. And there were just a lot of times where I just felt like I wanted to shout from the top of a mountain, I'm not your dad. I'm not your, I'm not your youth pastor. I am not that guy. Like you're, you're heaping all of this baggage that you've got onto me as a result of this song that you're now associating with that. So what made you? All right. So yeah. So, Hey, the reason that y'all think it was rape culture is just because you were traumatized and it wasn't. And you need to remember that he's not your youth pastor. Yikes. I think that it's very, it's very hard to take the amount of public criticism that he got all at once when he wasn't expecting it. I do think that not expecting it when you specifically make a satirical song poking at a cultural soft point that has been quite Mm -hmm. a hot button issue for a while was egregiously stupid to not expect that amount of backlash, especially when you literally make a song joking about the kind of backlash that this kind of thing gets. But I do think it's hard to do that. To to to. So at first of all, grace from that perspective. Yes. Especially since he's not like he's just he's a musician. Yeah. Right. But oh my word! Like the the amount of like a lack of self awareness. Like no one was saying you are my dad or you are my. Youth. What they're saying is like oh my gosh, this is the same thing that my youth pastor said to me before he did X, Y, Z. Like, this is the same thing. And and those things matter. But the point point that we made in She Deserves Better, because this whole thing broke right as we were writing She Deserves Better. So so we included it in our book. And I think think this anecdote opens the modesty chapter. And I do want to say too, that Ali Beth Stuckey was mirroring what he said. I didn't have a clip of that because it just would have taken too much time. But she was agreeing that that a lot of these women were just traumatized. They were abuse Mm. victims and traumatized. And that that's why they were reacting that way. And the point that we were making, and she deserves better, is that the messages themselves caused trauma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The messages themselves caused trauma. They caused self-esteem to go down. If you were, if you grew up in a church that believed the modesty message, you had lower self-esteem. You were more likely to be sexually assaulted mm-hmm. within that church. Like, but, but it was the message itself, which was traumatic and which had long-term effects. And that's what people can't seem to admit. Well, and not only that, like, so there, there is that it is just the message itself is bad because again, we've created an additional gospel that we never needed. We've added baggage onto the cross that doesn't need to exist. But additionally, what if it even was just that everyone in the church who's traumatized and abused is, is, uh, is hurt by this. Mm -hmm. Do we then say... Well, we don't want you anyway. You're not the guests we wanted for our banquet. Totally. Because like there are so was, many parables about this. That was like, my there thought are as well. So many. It's like, oh, none of the rich folks can come. Oh no, it's just the traumatized ones. Up, oh, no one wants them. Cover up. Bye. Like that's not how the parable goes, right? You're supposed to invite in and and nurture yes. and take care yes. of 
the people who are hurt in society. So yeah. the church is saying, well, all you are just too broken for the church. I don't know who you're worshiping. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of like yeah. on either side, no matter which way you slice this argument, it doesn't hold up to the gospel. That's the point. Yeah. But yeah, I had a very similar thought. So I'm glad you said that. Namely, that like, surely Christians should care about speaking about other people's bodies in such a way that wouldn't be really difficult and hard and emotionally kind of resurfacing of deep wounds for people who have negative sexual experiences. Like, mm -hmm. is it like, what's essential? What's so essential about us like needing to talk about little girls bodies this way like surely we have other ways of doing it and by doing it i just mean like other ways of talking about like sexuality to young people so it, yeah it's almost as if there was like a prescription in scripture prescription in scripture that's kind of fun prescription <laughs> that said like you must talk to your young women in these exact terms about the way they dress and i guess my bottom line is like this is exactly the sort of things that as christians we should be doing to care for others and pastors and those in positions of authority should be especially sensitive to the types of words they use and the types of analogies and imagery and all sorts of things you know jesus says that not an uh, there's not a, an idle word that we won't be held accountable for and certainly with something as important and sensitive as human sexuality, we just need to be, I think, just so careful. And of course, like, we're all going to make mistakes and be like, oh, I shouldn't have phrased that that way. That was taken in a way that I didn't intend. Or I can see so and so told me this, that they were offended by that or that hurt, a, like, brought up a wound or an experience or was seen as disrespectful. Like, just apologize. I like exactly. It, yeah, just and, apologize. And, and, and it's it's something that no one expects anybody to kind of speak with perfect, non-offensive precision. And that's not even like something we should be shooting for because it's not realistic. It's just having the humility to hear when people are saying, you know, that was hard for me, and knowing what you do have kind of quote unquote biblical authority or divine authority to 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 say this is what i'm not going to apologize for and then the trappings around it perhaps like oh yeah you're right that could have been said differently or that was unhelpful or maybe that didn't need to be said at all yeah yeah i think there's a big difference between things that are in as well that a lot of these people don't seem to understand is that there are things that are individually triggering but are not collectively problematic Yes. For example, I have severe birth trauma. There are certain things that I'm just not ever going to talk about online yes. because I cannot give an unbiased opinion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there, additionally, there are issues like we talked about at the beginning where like there are people who are coming out of purity culture where, you know, if you say that like, you know, I still believe that sexual ethics are important to have and sexual boundaries are beneficial, that will be personally triggering to them. That's hard for people. Yes. But it's also okay to have some things like, yeah, this is personally triggering. And so you're free to opt out of this conversation, but the conversation is still going to happen versus mm -hmm. things that are collectively harmful. That's and I really think helpful. that they're, they're switching helpful. what the two are quite yeah. frequently. And so what or they're conflating doing... them into one category, like exactly. if anyone's offended, it's just like the Bible mm -hmm. says, deal with it, shut your mouth. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Right. So I think I think that's that's a big problem, right, where we need yeah. to recognize there are things that might be individually triggering, but are collectively beneficial. Yeah. Versus things that might not be that might be individually helpful, but collectively harmful. Right. So some mm -hmm. people said, well, I was really helped by these specific messages. Like, that's great. Collectively, yeah. it yeah. increased rates of all these bad things that happen. So you can go do your thing that works for you. That's fine. But don't put it on other people. And, and, and you can also say it's OK for, for people to say, I actually had a positive outcome from purity culture. Sure. Yeah. yeah. We're not saying that everybody had a negative outcome. Yeah. Individuals may have had a positive outcome. Like maybe it was because of purity culture that you didn't get mess around in high school. And then you met the love of your life at 21 and you totally. married, you had a great marriage. Like 
good for you. We're, we're not trying to say your story doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to say, please understand that you were the exception. And also that there also may have been multiple routes to get you to that place. And one of those routes may not have had as many dead bodies on the side of it. Exactly. So that's all we're saying. And so, but, but all of this, when we, when we try to figure, Hey, what's individually Trump, Trump, the triggering versus collectively harmful, what's all these different things. It really does come down to the idea that like what you were mentioning earlier is, are we talking about a male centric view of this? Sure. Because I think you wanted to talk about that too. Well, I do. But what I really want to get back to though, before we even get to that, is a lot of the criticism that was put at, at, and I don't mean to say that Zach, Zach's book has got a ton of criticism. It has just this one stupid review, but I really like Zachary's response. But, but what the Gospel Coalition was saying was that, or Shane Morris at the Gospel Coalition Mm -hmm. was that Zachary wasn't focused enough on sin. He was focused on therapy. Sure. And he was getting away from sin. And this is kind of what Matt, Matthew West and Ali Bestucki were saying too. It's like, we're all, we're all we're talking about is trauma and, and they're taking it out. They're, they're critiquing us because we're not talking about sin anymore. We're talking about harm and we're ignoring sin. And it's like, no, 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 no. Because dehumanization matters. Objectification matters. And you said this, Zach, purity culture isn't simply an extreme version of historic Christian sexual ethics. It's a perversion of Christian sexual ethics. It's not too Christian. It isn't Christian enough. And that's it because it doesn't care. Like purity culture didn't care about the harm done. It was just trying to make everybody look good on the outside. Yeah. And it's Mm. not that we are ignoring sin. It's that we're saying harm actually matters. I think yeah. also we're 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 we have been given such a cheap idea of what sin yes. is. Correct. Yes, correct. <laughs> like is sin because about it excludes dehumanization and abuse? Yeah, like the idea of sin is about like the idea that you polish the outside of the cup, but the inside is still is still dirty, yeah. right? Like the mm-hmm. the like my, our, our mm. concept of sin, especially in in the very the Gospel Coalition folks of family, those realms is so much about whether or not you're following the right steps, mm-hmm. whether or not you're doing the right things, and it's so little about whether or not the impact that you're having on others is that they look more or less like Christ. Which is exactly Fred Stoker's quote, because he's saying the sin was what I do myself to myself. It's not what I do to other people. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and I think that a view of sin that ignores harm and trauma doesn't actually care about sin at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my. I actually don't think the Gospel Coalition takes sin seriously enough, ironically, because yes. I think that they they negate an entire category mm-hmm. and the entire point of what sin is, yeah. which is a marring of God's creation. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. that's and a then, theological then, discussion for a different yes, podcast. And then your last point, and you may you probably had other points in your review. I was just pulling out the ones that I thought that I sure. thought reflected on. She deserves better as well. Is that in this whole review, Morris doesn't mention really the impact on women that purity culture had. And that seems to be consistently missing is when people look at those of us who are speaking up against purity culture, they're just not acknowledging the harm that was done to women. It's like they can't see it. It's like it doesn't matter. And I find that really problematic. Yeah, I think that's what's been to some extent so powerful about you can kind of say the me too moment on is the way I think women um, collectively kind of grab the mic and broadcast. This is our, these are our experiences. We're sick of the world, not caring about them, diminishing them, downplaying them and having, I think women like yourselves, enter into various conversations both in the culture but in this for the sake of this conversation more more focused on the church having women enter into these conversations around sexuality that have often been kind of male gaze in the way they've been framed up and male centric in the way that the the advice and regulations around sexuality are articulated just in these few years i feel like where the women have been insisting on having a seat at the table, I think we see how some of the imbalances of an overly 
And not even like just a male perspective, but like a skewed male perspective, it seems to me. Like, I don't want to say like, here's what men have to bring to the conversation. And we also, of course, I want to say that. Like, and but and I, I want to say like the, the way men were leading the conversation was unhelpful. It wasn't just that the women's part was missing. It was that I think it was unhelpful and the women's part was missing. Yeah. So I think, <laughs> I think having the women as part of the conversation can help us see the way that some men at least were leading these conversations was unhelpful and again can open up helpful dialogue for like women just being like hey when you make that analogy or when you talk about an eight-year-old like that makes us feel uncomfortable and like hey like i'm a sexual assault survivor and i've always had a really hard time with this but i gotta listen to men in the church talk about this just kind of on the regular every time there's kind of like a marriage be faithful to your spouse sermon that's really hard for me. Like just the the fact that there is, I think, a new permission structure that's a that's emerging where women can feel like they can and should and have a duty to the health of the church to talk about those things and bring them up and discuss them. Mm -hmm. And what I want to see on the male side of it, and this is some, part of what I was trying to model with my book, is men i think also have a, a christian duty to listen and care and be humble and repent when that is necessary and do and and be willing to heaven forbid learn from something a woman tells you or something she is you know i'm obviously being facetious we've been using <laughs> yeah. but that i think is so key to these sorts of things and it's also like this is what i was trying to get at with the dedication to my book. The dedication mm -hmm. for my book is to all the women who spoke up first, because I mm -hmm. think that was so essential in my experience. And as I look at my experience as kind of a microcosm for this, I didn't, I didn't get it. I, I like, I really didn't, I really didn't get it until my wife started talking to me about this stuff. And yeah. I didn't get it until I started listening to the stories of women who had been harmed in the church in context similar to the ones that I grew up in or uh, and yeah, and that was a really a really key moment for me, you know, extended moment, not just like this one thing happened mm -hmm. one time, but a process where I came to terms with my own brokenness, the ways that I had you know, absorbed and in some ways participated in a culture and a context that was that was harming women, or at the very least, leaving the door open or creating a permission structure around very serious harms that can that could befall women and other vulnerable people like children and, and young boys and all yeah. of this. So and you know, I, I really appreciate the way you talked about so honestly and authentically in non-toxic masculinity. Again, it's a really great book. People often ask me for, for referrals of books you could read about for men. And this one's great. He quotes us in, from Great Sex Rescue quite a bit in it. <laughs> and appreciate appreciate your partnership. So Zachary, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing such a great response to that review. And we will sure. put a link to that response too. Where can people find you? If they want to find you. Oh my goodness. I, I have a personal website, ZacharyCWagner.com that, oh my goodness, is so out of date. But this review is published on there. I am in hibernation on social media, but I hope to emerge from the fog sometime. I approve uh, of a social media yes. hibernation. Yeah. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, part of it part of it is I'm I'm trying to finish up my PhD and trying to move a family across an ocean and all these sorts of things. Lots going on. So but, what you uh, mean is they can find you on Amazon. You can find me for just non toxic. Don't, and yeah, correct. Yeah, <laughs> anywhere books are sold. Right. Anywhere books are sold, and yeah, I'll be doing some other stuff in the future as well. So keep all right. On, well, keep thank you so that. much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, great to see you as always. Thanks for the invite. I'm so grateful that Zachary is writing for men because mm -hmm. you know we can't do everything and and. I <laughs> People keep saying as much as people keep asking us to do everything, no. But you know, as I was as I was listening to some of those clips that we shared, and as, especially the one from Bob Gresh, which really which really got to me, I know that he and Dana must be so reeling with all of the criticism that they're getting. Mm -hmm. Like it must be really difficult. And I truly believe that they meant well. They were a product of their culture too. They went to Cedarville University. They went to an extremely authoritarian. Yeah, and I do want to say for the record, if you're listening, you're like, well, Cedarville's not that bad. Cedarville's not bad. 
It is. It is. Sweetheart. Like, yeah. like it's it's pretty intense. It's pretty crazy. Which doesn't mean that we don't think that the people there are Christian. No. We're not saying that. But it just, just means that it's not a safe place. Yeah. And it's really yeah. rules-based fundamentalism. And, and they grew up in that too. So they were a product of it. And, and you can see that in so much of their teaching where... You know, I think that Bob grew up with a lot of shame around sexuality. Dana grew up with a lot of shame around sexuality. Mm-hmm. And they ended up perpetrating it on a whole other generation. Mm-hmm. And it's just time to stop. It's just trying time to stop. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things Bob was saying is, well, we need more nuance because if we don't talk about, we still need to talk about purity and about, you know, about modesty and all of these things. And it's like, well, the thing is, you can just talk. You can just focus on Jesus. Well, we actually found in our study that there was a good group of kids who were highly religious and hadn't really heard these messages or hadn't mm-hmm. really internalized them growing up. And they were fine. They did really well. They did really well. <laughs> like they weren't out there like having orgies at age 13. Like no. they were, they were just kind of fine. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it, I know we were talking about this ahead of time. I said, it just feels to me like we're sitting here in this battle of stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. You know, the older brother grabbing your hands, like, ah, stop hitting yourself. And yeah. Bob Gresh is sitting there like, well, what's the solution? That if this is hurting you, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to stop, to stop, mm-hmm. stop, stop playing the stupid game. And he's like, well, no, because someone's going to play the stupid games. Like, no, they, they won't though. <laughs> like, unless you start making them hit themselves in general, if you're like, yeah. hey, don't hit yourself. They'll be like, yeah, okay. Like yeah. there's a level where people do not want to act in self-destructive ways. Mm-hmm. This is, this is genuinely, people do tend to make the choices that in their environment, with their background, in their context, seem to get them to a place they want to get to. Mm-hmm. The problem is when people don't have the supports or the background or the hope that things could get better. It's not that they just don't have strict enough rules or enough shame, typically, yeah. right? Like mm-hmm. if we want people to not make bad decisions about sex when they're 14, the issue, the, the answer isn't to tell them you'll be permanently damaged and no good you know, you no babies ever. Yeah, exactly. It's not to use scare tactics. It's to, it's to actually give them the context and the information that they need to make good choices. And also the hope that if they make good choices, it'll be for a reason and Mm -hmm. they'll get the payoff. That's really what it seems is much more necessary. Mm -hmm. And none of that requires telling eight year olds that the grown men around them will find them intoxicating. Yeah. Because you know what, if you're telling young girls that grown men will find them intoxicating, you're probably making it more normalized Mm -hmm. that when a grown man finds them intoxicating, they don't see that as a problem. And so they don't remove themselves from that situation. So then what do they think? Oh, grown men do find children intoxicating versus the nine-year-old being like, mom, why did Tracy's dad tell me that I looked like, like, why did he do that? They don't ask like, yeah, well, that's That's how men are. So you end up in this self-fulfilling prophecy too. And so this idea that we have to have a solution, the solution is just to stop. Stop normalizing pedophilia, even if by accident. Mm -hmm. Stop normalizing rape culture. And yeah, it is rape culture. Mm -hmm. Stop normalizing this idea that boys are only held back from raping girls because they wore a skirt that was two inches longer. Yeah. Like these are... Yeah. Stop normalizing that guys are lust monsters and that girls are sexually anorexic. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's not... It's, it's just, it's not, it's not true. And our girls deserve the truth and our boys deserve the truth. And life is a whole lot better when you can just have honest conversations that aren't based in fear and authoritarianism. And that's all that we're asking for. So on this one year anniversary, can we end the podcast by reading some reviews? Sure. Because so these are some of the most recent ones that have come in. I just went to amazon.com, looked up She Deserves Better, encourage you all to do that because there's so many hundreds and hundreds of reviews. One woman said, this is exactly what the church needs, but seems to be rejecting. <laughs> I don't think Sheila and her team's ideas are new or hyper scriptural above or more than scripture. She goes along with scripture, not against it. She doesn't seek to improve upon scripture but illuminate it where the church has consistently missed the mark. The book shines light on blind spots of the church and highlights wrong assumptions when it comes to sex and marriage and statements that have been relied upon as pastoral care and hurtful to women. Yeah. Yeah. And then this other woman, I love this one. I'm a mom of three teenage boys. I read this book and have taken each chapter and talked with my boys about the content provided. I'm doing my best to raise healthy, godly men. And this is a tool, not just for moms of girls. I was raised in purity culture and I truly wish this book was around for my teenage years. Oh, that's really sweet. I love hearing that people are using it with their boys. That's great. 
And then another one just from March says, I grew up in purity culture and I've had to deal with a lot of hurt from its harmful teachings. This book was so healing for me. One of the things I love most about the authors is their commitment to staying true to the Bible while promoting healthy research-based messages. I wish I had this book when I was growing up, but at least I have the chance to share it with my daughter. I highly recommend this book and everything else from the same authors. Oh, that's so thank you everyone for writing reviews for buying she deserves better we just when we looked on amazon at the point when we're recording this the paperback is really cheap right now i never know how long that's going to last because every now and then when a book gets a lot of action amazon lowers the price mm -hmm. <laughs> so hey you know what if you go and you get it now then maybe maybe it'll still be cheap so go take a look at amazon read the reviews and come celebrate with us maybe even get a copy for your youth pastor and send it along or for youth volunteers so that we don't do this to the next generation so thank you for joining us on the beer marriage podcast and we will see you again next week <laughs> bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>